Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today we'll be talking project management, which, uh, as I was telling with Mike, I, I can't quite keep project management or practice management straight. This is the one not where you're trying to um, uh, figure out how to ensure you have a good business, but instead ensure that you're managing the project properly. Right, Mike? Yeah, so it's the kind of overarching kind of how a project runs from the beginning to end, c contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so um, we're going to do another one of these mock exams where we're going to cover a couple of topics um, for this particular division, which should kind of give you um, kind of a good foundation to get started. After this episode, you know, you're going to have Again, some good sort of foundational ideas to help you feel comfortable demonstrating, you know, that you understand the concepts and principles in this exam. Before you get started, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, we're going to discuss the next exam, project, I'm sorry, programming and analysis. That's the one that's almost like schematic design. Yeah, kind it's of kind of the beginning of a design. beginning of a project or you're, you're, you've just gotten the, the contact from the client and you, so you're thinking about con the initial contract and the surveys and kind of a, how you're going to go from there into schematic design and all those kind of early uh, decision-making issues. Yeah, and we're going to do just like this one, we're going to do a mock exam, which is going to give you, uh, again, some of the basic foundations uh, to get started on this exam. Uh, before we get started, though, um, we've made a couple of additions to our pro subscriptions at Black Spectacles, which I'm excited to tell you guys about. Uh, first, we, uh, we launched our practical application videos. So again, this was added to, so everyone who has a pro subscription um, to Black Spectacles, you already have access to this. What we did is we went around the country, we filmed uh, licensed architects from different cities um, and in different, of course, firms um, to tell some stories that relate to the concepts that we're, you know, that you're trying to understand in the exam. So, for example, if Mike's teaching about bricks and sort of, you know, how a brick's uh, made, what it's made out of, then, you know, what we tried to do was, you know, find someone who had, who had worked, who was working on a brick project and talk about some of the considerations they used um, and so forth. So those videos are have been added to your pro subscription. Um, and then also we, we created a, a, our Black Spectacles Master Study Guide, which is a single document that really has everything you need to be successful. And it includes a day-by-day -day guide of what to study. So it's an awesome you know, place to kind of go when you're like, man, I'm not exactly sure um, what to start with first. Um, I'm not exactly sure what day. Um, I'm, you know, I should be doing this, whether I should be on flashcards or practice exams or, or whatever. So it's a really nice um, uh, guide that you can, you can all use. Again, that's available with our pro subscription. Um, and let's see what else here. We have a couple, a few other things. Um, we also recently launched our private tutoring hours with licensed architects. So if you're looking for a dedicated one-on-one -on -one time uh, with a recently licensed architect, you can check out our website uh, for information on our tutors. Um, that's already proven to be a really valuable resource. People are, you know, meet, the idea is, right, you meet virtually with someone. Um, they develop essentially, you know, a plan. You guys craft sort of um, a plan for what it is that you need help with. Um, so it's a real nice, um, you know, kind of one-on-one experience that folks have. Um, and then also, um, you know, we're excited that, you know, we've submitted five of our exams to NCARB um, under their NCARB approved test prep provider program, and they have approved all five of them. Um, they had the last one under review right now, so we're, we're waiting to uh, waiting to find out about that one. Um, so another exciting uh, sort of uh, thing going on, um, and we're running uh, my uh, my my guys here. You know, they're teaching me about Instagram. <laughs> I, I'm saying that you know just to sort of make myself feel old, I guess. But um, um, AJ told uh, told me to have all of you guys check out our Instagram story today, um, and uh, you know we took a couple of pictures. I guess AJ is going to come in here and take some video of us later, so you guys will get a little be behind the scenes look of how we produce the show, which, which hopefully won't be too embarrassing. Um, <laughs> um, I often like to remind folks that if you like your boss to pay for your Black Spectacles membership, be sure to tell them about our firm licenses for firms of any size, um, whether you work at a hundred or a ten-person firm. Um, we have all kinds of different options, so just go to blackspectacles.com/firms to learn more about that. At the end of our episode today, we have a special discount on individual memberships, so stick around for that. And of course, my uh, esteemed guest here is Mr. Mike Newman. If you don't know Mike, he's a senior uh, lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's the founder of Shed Studio, and he is the instructor for Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep curriculum. Um, 
uh, which if you haven't checked it out, you can go to our website, blackspectacles.com, to watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Um, today, uh, we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box. And with that, Mike, Okay. It's, uh, it's all in your hands. Thank you so much. Oh, um, I should also mention, I'm sorry, oh. but uh, we will, many of you submitted answers to the mock exam, um, so we will be uh, doing a giveaway uh, at the end of the show um, of a free t-shirt as well as a, um, a free one-month uh, pro membership. Well, there you go. So there you go. Who doesn't want a t-shirt? All right. That sounds awesome. Have you seen the t-shirts? They are pretty cool. Uh, I actually have one of the t-shirts, which is great. You should have more than one. Uh, okay, so we're going to jump right in. Like I said a few minutes ago, uh, project management, the concept of the project management exam. Uh, practice management is sort of how you run the firm, so like getting insurance, understanding how you create a, a team of uh, consultants, uh, all of those kinds of things, uh, kind of the big picture of, uh, of what it means to be a business person in the architectural context. Project management is really about this sort of arc of uh, how projects go forward. So uh, it could be about anything from kind of the beginning of a project that uh, you're having your first conversations with, with clients and what kinds of contracts would you choose that would fit certain kinds of project delivery, uh, kind of being able to give advice about those issues. It would be about kind of where certain kinds of work should happen. Does it happen in the beginning of a project? Does it happen towards the end of a project? Uh, it's about how the uh, uh, naming of uh, uh, taking project notes and, and logs and uh, all of those kinds of things, like how you think about those as it goes through from uh, the beginning of a project to schematic design, design development into CDs and bidding and then eventually into construction administration. Uh, all of these issues are touched in other exams uh, in the sense that they focus in on one area. This is looking at kind of the big picture across the arc of a project. So uh, we have a few different questions here just to sort of get everybody, uh, give you a chance to talk about a few different issues. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, sort of dive in and then use it as a platform to have a little bit of a wider discussion. So I'm going to jump in and get this one going. Okay. Uh, all right, so question number one. Uh, a uh, client uh, asks you for a proposal for a new project. Uh, during your discussions, it becomes clear that the client does not yet know what project delivery method they would like to follow, and they ask for your advice. The project is for a small, affordable housing apartment building that will be funded through uh, some sort of state or federal grant. Uh, and you have to decide, well, what project delivery method would you suggest? So a couple of quick things to say. Uh, project delivery, that's sort of the key thing of what's going on here. And it's pretty important uh, issue for uh, the concept of um, uh, this project, man <clears throat> excuse me, project management. So project delivery, the idea here is, if somebody, if you're going to do a project with somebody, if you're the architect and you're going to be working with somebody, there's many different ways that you can actually uh, do the work, right? The overall project can get done. It could be that you and your partner uh, are going to put together a project and you're going to design it and your partner is going to build it. That would be design build. Uh, it could be that the uh, owner is going to hire a construction manager. Uh, and they're going to be deeply involved, so they have this sort of third-party person who's going to be looking over your shoulder, and then you're producing the work, and then uh, kind of going through the construction manager to get to the, to the owner. There's many different ways that you can do it, but each one uh, has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some take longer, some are faster, some are cheaper, some are probably more expensive. Uh, and each one has different contracts and different ways that everybody relates to each other. Uh, so the question is, in the context of doing affordable housing that's going to be uh, funded through uh, grant money, federal and state grant money, the question is, well, what would the likely way that you would want to move forward? So let's look at a couple of the potential answers. Uh, one potential answer we have here is D. Uh, fast track, and I can tell you absolutely, fast track is not going to be uh, not going to be the one. And the reason for that is that uh, fast track, the concept of fast track, is all about speed. So 
if you're going to do a fast track project delivery, that means there's some really important reason why you have to get that project done right away. So let's say uh, you're doing a project and there's a school uh, and the school needs to uh, start in, you know, on September 1st and uh, you've got four months to build the addition. Well, you know, it'd be nice to take all the time you needed to get the drawings right. It'd be nice to be able to sort of move through and kind of, uh, you know, talk to the teachers and talk to everybody, you kind of do all the things you would normally want to do for a design process, but you just don't have enough time. The kids are going to show up and you need to be able to do it. Or maybe you're doing a stadium or something and the football games are going to start on, you know, some specific date. Or, uh, or maybe you're just doing a very expensive piece of real estate and the holding costs of the piece of land uh, when it's not being productive are so expensive that it just means a lot to get it going really fast. So fast track is all about those moments where it's speed, speed, speed. And the way it works is the architects start doing the drawings and they draw a foundation plan with an excavation concept. And they hand those over to the contractors and they start building it. So the architects haven't even drawn the building yet, but their uh, contractors are already building it. And then while the foundation is being put in, the architects are working on, well, how is the structural frame going to work? And so they do the, excuse me, those drawings. Uh, and they put out, put out a package for those drawings. So as soon as the contractors are done with the foundation, now they have the drawings for the uh, overall steel frame or whatever kind of frame it is. Now they're building on that. So it's a way of doing things in this sort of crazy way where you're drawing while they're building. And clearly, there's no way you could possibly predict all of the issues. Like, you're bound to have a situation where you've already put a slab down, uh, but now you realize, oh, wait, a, a you know, drain pipe needs to come down and go under the slab and out. We're going to have to cut that slab that we just put in in order to do it because you've learned more as you've gone along. And so that's bound to happen, and so you have to build that in with Fast Track. And so the reason you would do Fast Track is that that loss of extra money that you know is going to happen is either less money than I'm going to lose from the, for the example of the holding costs of the land. Uh, you know, if it's going to cost me a million dollars to hold the land an extra year, well then spending an extra 400,000 uh, doing it fast track and fixing all the mistakes, I've saved 600,000. So it, in those situations can make sense. And in other situations where the deadline is just all important, well, then you're willing to spend a little bit more to make that happen. Well, that's just not what the state and federal grants are going to be about. Now, if the question had specifically said something about speed and time, then you'd be into uh, looking at fast track. So let's think about design build, C. So design build, where there's either two different firms, an architecture firm and a contracting firm, or it's one firm together. But the important thing about design build is that to the owner, it's considered one entity. So the design build, designers and builders, it doesn't matter how it's structured legally or whatever, from the legal standpoint from the owner, they have one contract with the design build entity. Uh, and that can be very advantageous for lots of different reasons, but it's not as uh, transparent as other systems are. And if you're working in a situation where you've got uh, a lot of state and federal uh, overseers, people watching what's going on, design build is a little bit of an awkward situation. The classic system is design bid build, where you have an architect as one entity, a contractor, general contractor as another entity, and the owner as the third entity. And the big advantage of design bid build, uh, there's a couple of advantages, but the big advantage of design bid build is that uh, while the architect and the owner are working with each other, and they put together a set of plans. At some point, there's this other party that comes in, the general contractor, the GC. They come in, and now they're looking at those plans, and they're giving other advice. They're bringing in another set of expertise. Uh, and so the owner knows, because the contractor has looked at it, that the architect hasn't gone crazy and, and spent too much money. Uh, but equally, when the contractor is trying to gouge the owner for whatever, or some other kind of issue comes up, well, then the owner has the architect to sort of look over the shoulder and make sure and give commentary and help the owner through those situations. Uh, and then equally, if the owner starts saying, well, yeah, you built it, but I don't want to pay for it. Well, now the architect and the contractor can sort of team up 
and say, well, we have a project a process that you have to follow and here's how it works and, and everybody is sort of overlooking each other. Well, with design build, you don't have that. You just have the two entities. And so if something goes wrong, it's very hard for the owner to actually know uh, if anything even happened because there's nobody really on their side watching over the other. Uh, and so it has its uh, downsides, especially in the state and federal uh, kind of grant situations. But design build can be faster. It can be very advantageous. There's a bunch of reasons to do it. It's just not in this context. So that leaves us with A or B. So design bid build in B I just described. Integrated project delivery is sort of a newer concept. It's a, the idea is where you, you think of everybody as coming on board as part of a team and that everybody has their own self-interest. So the architect, the contractor, the owner, the, some of the other subs, and all of those people come together and describe what they need to get out of the project. And then they work in a way that uh, tries to facilitate everybody coming out a winner. So like I said, with design bid build, it's a little bit adversarial. Now hopefully it's a pleasant adversarial, but it's a little bit adversarial in its, in its makeup. And the idea of integrated project delivery is you try to get rid of that and kind of put everything on the table and make it so that everybody is working with and for each other. So some big advantages to the integrated project delivery, and it's taken off in certain sectors. But again, in the con context of the state and federal grants, it really, the, it's hard to sort of make that work. The, the grant folks really want that slightly adversarial quality because they want to be able to know that somebody is looking over the shoulder and making sure everything's sort of flowing right. And this is the standard way of doing things. So the answer here is definitely B, design, bid, build. Uh, so hopefully that gives a kind of a bigger picture idea of how the project delivery discussion happens. We'll actually talk a little bit more about that on a couple of the, the next ones. So we knocked a few people out there. We're down to 139. Um, I think we knocked about 50 people out. Okay, moving on to the next. Hit it. Okay, number two. So uh, with number two, uh, the question here is, uh, Typical construction bid documents include, and then we have a couple different possibilities, A, construction drawings and specifications, B, the instruments of service, C, construction drawings and the project manual, including addenda, D, all of the above. Uh, I, I put this in, it's, it's a little bit of a tricky question, um, so apologies. Uh, um, I, my understanding is that NCARB has decided to get rid of and doesn't do all of the above questions anymore. Um, so this is not a great example of the exact kind of question that you would get. But I wanted to do this because I wanted you to start thinking about the kind of accretion of information. Uh, so that's why I wanted to put it in, in, in this context. So I just wanted to be clear that you, you won't likely get a lot of ones like this. Um, so construction bid documents. First of all, when do the bid documents happen? Um, so, a typical project, you've got the sort of starting point, right, and then you go through SD, and then you go through DD, so that's schematic design and design development, and then you get to CDs, uh, and then there's a bidding phase, and then you have the construction administration phase, and then there's sort of a kind of end game of various warranties and other issues that things that happen at the end. Um, so, when you look at the contracts, the contracts will all have these uh, five main categories built in. And you don't have to do all of them. There's certainly some uh, uh, contracts in certain situations, the owners will say, yeah, we, we, you know, we'll be fine with the construction. We don't need you for that part. Or uh, you, you know, we, we already have somebody who's done the schematic design. Now we just want you to do the DD and CD. Like, those things happen all the time. But the standard is you're going to do all five of these plus the beginning and the end. So then the question is, well, what happens at each of those phases? Uh, so in the beginning, before you even get to SD, you're you know, signing a contract with the, with the owner. You're determining with the owner what the project delivery method is going to be because you, can't, you have to choose a contract that fits to that. So that has to be decided first. There's going to be an overall project budget. 
So one of the things you're going to do in that very beginning is you're going to kind of figure out what kind of budget do we have. If, if they say, uh, you know, we've got a million dollars to spend on this project, well, you have to spend a little time before you even really start doing any work. Well, how big a project is that? And what does the million dollars cover? Is that a million dollars in construction? Or is that a million dollars uh, for the overall, including buying property and buying furniture and paying for the lawyers and paying for the architect? Right, so understanding the budget, what it really means, kind of understanding the scale that is likely to come out. So using kind of comparative numbers to other projects you've done or maybe square footage costs to get a sense of scale. So you haven't even done any real work yet, but you've started to sort of already think about cost and scale and how all that works. And then when I get to schematic design, I'm going to be thinking about what are, what are the big picture ideas? So I've got a program. I've got a survey, and I've got some geotechnical information, and I've got some environmental information uh, from the owner. They hand me all of that information, and I take that information and start uh, thinking about, well, given the survey, given this location, given the, what I know about urban and architectural issues, uh, I'm going to take this program and think of it in these ways. So it's big picture, schematic, abstract ideas. Now, these days, a lot of the time, those abstract ideas end up being 3D models. It's a little confusing because the contracts don't really work all that well with the 3D model kind of uh, schematic design thing, but it's, that is definitely what's happening. So the ship has sailed, but um, just know that it might be a little different from the way that you, in everyday practice, do things, the way that the exam and the way the exams talk about it, um, the contracts, I mean, talk about it. So that SD phase, the concept there is big picture, uh, bold ideas, you know, uh, how is the overall thing going to work? And then you'd get a sign off at the end of that from the owner. And part of putting that together is you did a sort of general idea of how much space you can build because of the, of the budget. You're going to do another cost estimate, still a very generalized cost estimate, but you're going to do another one at SD. Because uh, you want to make sure that you haven't let it slip and get bigger or creep and become a project that isn't going to be doable by the owner because there's, you know, there's no reason to keep going on a project if they can't afford it. So then you're moving into DD, design development. And this is truly, you're just, a, a, one of the SD um, options has been chosen. And now you're moving forward and you're developing that de design. So when you get to the end of DD, you should have a very clear actual design. All the materials should be pretty well understood. Uh, the shapes and sizes of all the rooms should be understood. The uh, general, like which walls are two hour walls, which are walls are one hour walls in terms of fire rating and egress and uh, what kind of uh, stairwells are things. How is the whole thing sort of working? So you've moved from these sort of abstract ideas of schematic and now you're into the actual, like what is it actually? But both SD and DD are still pretty much, you're, you're having your conversation with the owner. And so they're kind of presentation style uh, drawings. Now DD tends to look, you're sort of moving into CD, so it's a little different. But essentially, SD and DD are conversations with the owner. CDs, the uh, CD moment, that particular moment is now you're changing focus. Now you've had your conversation with the owner, and they've signed off at the end of DD, and so now you're having your conversation with whoever the eventual general contractor is, you're having your conversation with bidders, you're having your conversation with code officials and permitting officials, uh, and so there's a whole different focus on that. And I wanna just sort of focus on the term CDs. So a lot of people will say construction drawings, uh, that's what that phase is. Uh, there's a couple of other CD terms. The actual term there is contract documents. And the reason that's important is it kind of puts, it sort of highlights what's actually going on. When you're doing your work by the end of DD, what you're really preparing once you've gone from DD into that CD phase, that contract document phase, is you are creating the contract between two other people. If you imagine a contractor is going to say to an owner, say, yeah, I can build this building for $5 million for you. Well, what building? What, what are they committing to? The only way that contract makes any sense is that your drawings are part of the contract. So they're saying, I'm gonna build this building drawn on this date by this architect, and I'm gonna label all that in the contract, and then the owner says, awesome, five million, great, let's move forward. 
We now know we, we're speaking the same language. It's apples to apples. The owner knows what the contractor's bid is going to get them. So you are creating their conversation, their contract. And so it's a legal document in all sorts of interesting uh, other ways. All of it is legal. You know, you're, you have a contract to do certain work. So the SD and DD all has legal aspects. But the CD set, the contract document phase, is really this sort of legal understanding. Um, and then once you're done with that, you're going to bid it out. This isn't a standard design bid build setup. If it doesn't say a project delivery, then you should assume design bid build. If it's about design build or about some other project delivery method, it'll say that specifically. Uh, so I get to the bidding phase, and actually as the architect, I have quite a lot of work to do. I have to present to all the different bidders. I have to give them the construction drawings. I have to give them the project manual. I have to give them uh, a bunch of other information. And the other stuff that you're giving them is uh, this uh, set of like bid documents. Uh, and the bid documents are going to be like, let's say that $5 million project I just mentioned, let's say you're going to uh, hand the, you know, to five bidders and you're going to have this drawings for a $5 million project and hand that over. Well, as you hand over that, uh, that project, like, are you just expecting them to give you a sheet of paper that says uh, 5,100,000 or 400, uh, or 4,950,000? Like, that would be good to have those numbers, but that's not the full conversation. So the whole bidding period, the architect actually has quite a lot of work. And what they're doing is they're creating the conversation that you're going to, you're getting, you're figuring out what information you need from the contractors in order to have the right conversation with the owner in order to be able to figure out, first of all, who should be chosen and become the GC, but also to craft the final version of the project. Almost no project uh, looks exactly like what the bid documents look like when you first put them out because you get information back. And now we decide, because of the way we've crafted the bid documents, well, we can't afford the east wing, so we're going to do everything else but not the east wing. Or we can't afford the terrazzo floor, so we're going to go with vinyl tile or whatever it is. So we've asked specific information in our bid documents. So the bid documents have a very key sort of pride of place because that's how you're going to get the correct information back uh, so that you can judge from one to the other. So. Uh, then once you've chosen a bidder, now you've, cho you've chosen them, they become the general contractor, they sign a contract with the owner, uh, and then it's now their job to sort of build out that uh, design intent that you created and make it manifest, to make it real. So your job through all of this is ideas, decision making, design intent. You're figuring out from the program what they need, how is it going to work, how is the exiting going to work. You're looking at codes, you're, you're thinking about it, it's design. The general contractor is now going to make it, right? And so their contracts are very different from each other. They look really similar, but they're very different from each other uh, because their thing is about conforming to the making of it. Your thing is about, did you make the right decisions? Um, so, okay, that leads us back to this whole concept here, the A, B, C, and D. Uh, and the one that's going to be the important thing here, the sort of tricky part here, so again, apologies, uh, B, instruments of service. Uh, what an instruments of service is, is everything that you as the architect produce on a project. So you have a bunch of memos that you've gone back and forth with on the owner about something. You maybe have done research about a building material and you've got an Excel sheet that shows costs and different uh, positives and negatives or something like that. You've got sketches that you've done. Well, those are things, uh, including also the instrument service, uh, would also be the construction drawings and the project manuals and the specifications and all of that stuff. It's all the work that you've done. But you're not going to give all of those memos and those Excel sheets and some of those early sketches, you're not going to give those to the contractor. right? Those are things, the reason that the instruments of service is an important concept is that when you sign that contract with the owner, they have rights to all of your instruments of service for this project. Not for another project, not for the next project, but for this project, they have rights to all of those instruments of service, not just the construction drawings, not just the, the specification, 
not just the big sort of fancy packages, but all of that work. And if they ask for it, which it's pretty rare, they're not likely to ask for all your memos and, and all of that, but it does happen. And there are reasons why they might want it, legal reasons or if the uh, relationship goes south and they want to break the, the contract and go work with somebody else, they want to have all that information that they've already paid for and be able to get going as fast as they can with the other things. So the instruments of service is not the correct answer because that's a bigger category of work and it doesn't make sense in the context of the bid documents. So that means B and D are not the correct answer. So then the question is, is it A or C? And the sort of thing to remember here is I have a set of drawings. Um, and that set of drawings, uh, you know, I've got a whole bunch of different uh, sheets. Uh, there's the architectural sheets, there's the structural sheets, there's the engineers, there's all of that. And then I have the project manual. And the project manual is going to have all of the specifications um, that are going to be, uh, you know, the, the 1 through 16 divisions. Uh, so I've got the uh, 3, the concrete, the 4, the masonry, 5, the metals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the things about, all that detail information about warranties and, in, and installation and all of that. So the specifications. But I also have a whole series of bid documents like we were just talking about. Right? And those bid documents are going to be like a first letter that's going to be like an invitation to bid. Then there's going to be the form that you want the bid to come back on. Then there's going to be some other information about the, the site that's going to be important uh, that they need to know. Uh, then I'm going to have, uh, actually before I get to the specifications, I'm going to have uh, the general conditions and the supplementary conditions. So that's all the stuff that starts talking about, well, who's paying for the electrical during the construction? And, uh, do we have to have a, a porta john on the site? Uh, how does it get cleaned up? How does you know how's that going to work? All those sort of general things that don't have another place to go. You wouldn't put them on the drawings. You wouldn't put them in the specification directly. So all of that stuff is how uh, the the overall bid package is going to work. So I'm going to have the drawings. Um, uh, sorry, hang on a sec here. I'm going to I'm going to have the drawings in uh, this one section, I'm going to have the project manual, which is the bid documents, the general and supplementary conditions, the contracts, even though they're not signed yet, I have all of that information all in that upfront section, and then I get to the specifications. So here's the drawings, uh, and then the project manual, manual, which includes the specification. But there's another thing that still can be part of that bid document. There are bound to be questions that you're going to get through the process of the bidding. So somebody's going to look at something and they're going to find a mistake and they're going to call you up and they're going to say, hey, on uh, sheet A4 it says this, but it says something different on the detail on sheet uh, uh, A7.1. And your immediate feeling is you should just answer the question. It's like, oh yeah, we made the change, sorry we missed that. The one on A7.1 is correct. You should never do that. Right? Uh, in that context, you never actually answer the question. What you do is you take notes, you keep track of the notes. As you get a few questions, now you're going to put out the addenda. Right? So that's the addenda that's being talked about right there. Uh, and the addenda is, all right, here's a list of five questions that we've got. Here's the answers to those questions. It might be yes or no. It might be a more lengthy discussion. It might be a sketch. It might be a re, uh, resubmitting of, of some of the sheets. Uh, depends on, on how important and how big the question is. Uh, but the, by the time you get to the end of the bid process, the addenda is now part, and it might be multiple addendas, um, it is now part of the overall bid package. So we've got the construction documents in terms of the drawing, and we've got the construction uh, contract documents in terms of the uh, project manual, which includes uh, all the general conditions, the contracts, the bid information, and the specifications. And then we also have the addenda. And that whole package is the bid package. So C. Yikes. You knocked about like 100 people. Yeah. That, that. Like I said, that was a, it was a bit of a cheap uh, question. I apologize again. <laughs> the reason I did that is I wanted to sort of try to trick you into thinking it was accumulating 
uh, and it is, but then there's a point where it stops. And so that was the, con so yep. it was meant to be a conversation. So thanks for putting up with that. <laughs> Number three, uh, during construction, uh, during a construction inspection of these smoke clearing fans that are part of the fire suppression alarm system in a new school building, the inspector tells the general contractor that a more powerful fan will be needed. This actually happens all the time. It's happened to me, it's happened to a bunch of friends of mine, where as we go through, we have a whole plan and then the fire marshals come in and put a smoke bomb into a thing and see how, it, does, it, does the smoke actually get out in time? That's a typical thing for like assembly spaces and things like that. Uh, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, then they'll say, nope, you got to replace it. So, okay, the, the uh, inspector has said we needed a more powerful fan. The GC then tells the architect and the owner that the cost for this new fan will be $50,000. Reviewing the information from the inspector and the GC, the architect looks it over and tells the owner that the new fan configuration probably should only cost about $20,000. In the subsequent discussions, the GC isn't budging. The GC says, no, nah, I'm sticking with the $50,000. What should the architect do at that point? So we have a couple different possibilities. A, issue a construction change directive. B, issue a change order for the $20,000 that the architect believes uh, the cost should be. C, issue a change order for $50,000, but with a codicil that is attached to it that says the number is in dispute. Or D, issue an addenda with the new fan information. So a couple quick things we can do. One is D. It's not addenda because the addenda is only used, that term is only used during the bid phase. So we know it can't be the addenda because we're already in construction uh, and they are uh, looking at actual building stuff. So addenda is only used during, for the bid phase of these things. Uh, so we know it's not D. So then we look at uh, uh, C and we say issue a change order for $50,000, but with a codicil that says the number is in dispute. Well, that actually doesn't really make any sense. Uh, it seems like a good answer because it's sort of the truth. You really kind of want to move forward, but you want to say, wait, wait, we haven't actually agreed to this. But the entire point of a change order is that you are changing, the change of change order, you are changing the contract. So when you change the contract, you can't just sign the form and say, okay, here we are, we've changed the contract. Oh, but by the way, we don't believe it's the real contract. Like, then it's not the contract. Uh, so you can't just add something onto it that says, oh, yeah, we don't believe this number. Uh, so uh, when you do a change order, remember that it's changing the contract. So the contract got signed at the beginning of the construction, and now it keeps altering along the way because issues keep coming up. Uh, and those issues, just like a contract, will be about the main essence of the project. So the contract will have all sorts of bits of information in it. It'll be about lots of different things. But if you really broke it down to the core of it, the contract between the owner and the contractor, the GC, is going to be about cost, fee. It's going to be about time, schedule. And it's going to be about the scope of the work that's being talked about. Now, it's possible that whatever the change order is, is zero cost or zero delay in time or uh, uh, it's a change in cost only and not a change in the scope. So you don't necessarily have all three, but you're referencing all three of those issues every time you're messing with the contract. So you have a change order. You're going to say this will add zero days, but it's going to cost an extra $30,000 or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you're going to tell what the scope is. So C, unfortunately, even though it sounds good, isn't the, isn't the right answer. It's just not a reasonable thing. The change order is part of the contract. You can't just mess around with it. Okay, now about B. B looks good uh, if, if we can't do C, so we're just going to write the one for 20000 uh, because that's the number it should be because that's what the architect has determined. Uh, but who's going to sign that change order? The architect and the owner, really, the GC is going to sign it even though they say it's $50,000? Like, why would they sign that? They're not going to sign that change order. They're not going to change their contract for a number that they don't believe in. So B, sadly, can't work. What that means is what we have left here is A. Uh, and A is the construction change directive. This is sort of a weird, specific little kind of rule, but it's one that they kind of like to ask a question or two on, so you should definitely be familiar with the concept. So when you have your uh, 
uh, you've signed your contract uh, with the owner, of the, let's say the B101, and the GC has signed their contract with the owner of the A101. Could be a couple of other versions of that, but let's just say it's the 101s. Uh, in those contracts, there are lots of references, uh, both in the contract and to other elements outside of the contract, that are brought in that say, here's how we deal with disputes. Here's how we deal with uh, a problem that comes up. And there's a bunch of variations. Uh, some contracts may say, well, whatever it is, you're going to go to litigation, or whatever it is, uh, we're going to do arbitration. Or maybe it says, Can't, we're not going to allow litigation, we're not going to allow arbitration, we're only going to allow uh, mediation. Um, it's pretty untypical to do that. Usually it would be start with mediation and then go to arbitration, and then sometimes they don't allow litigation. Uh, so if there's a problem, there's a process that's built into the contracts for how to deal with that problem. But here you are in a situation where you're under construction, you're trying to get this thing done. Really, you're going to go into litigation that might take two years and the building's going to sit empty and like it just doesn't make any sense. Like you, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there's time is an integral part of the construction uh, and design process. And so they've built in a, a system to say, okay, we get that this is still in dispute. We get that uh, not everybody is on board. But by signing these contracts, we've all agreed to this sort of set of rules. And one of the rules is, all right, it's in dispute, but time is money. We have to keep moving. We are saying to you, general contractor, owner and architect are saying this by producing the construction change directive, go and build it anyway. We know you have a dispute about how much things are going to cost in the end, and we'll figure it out at some point. We'll go into arbitration or mediation or potentially litigation. Um, and when that comes, we'll get it all worked out. But for right now, we need to just get the work done. And then we can argue about it for whatever length of time we want to afterwards. Uh, it's an important idea because you start realizing, first of all, how the, the contracts are all working, but also uh, how important not just cost is, but time, right? So uh, scope, time, and cost are really what all of those uh, elements are about. Construction Change Directive, it's kind of a fascinating uh, sort of idea, and you'll definitely see it on the exam at some point. Awesome. Down to 29 over here. All right. Way to rock along the 29. Okay, number four. The biggest advantage for an owner of working with a construction manager is the CM, the construction manager, brings their own subcontractors. The CM guarantees the pricing. CM can make the construction go faster. The CM brings early pricing information to a design process. So construction managers, kind of a funny idea. What, what's happening here is, uh, Essentially, uh, the way I always like to think of it is you sort of imagine that the construction manager works directly for the owner. So they're not, it's not a contract that they've signed uh, with a third party. This is somebody who's like an employee of the owner. Now, in actuality, they don't have to be an employee. There's all sorts of different contracts that work in that situation. But I think it's easier to sort of imagine it that way. So imagine that they're working for the owner directly. So. Uh, they may know a number of subcontractors, but they are not a GC. They are not taking the risk, unless it's specifically it's a small fraction of CMs that take risk. It's a long story. It'll say risk if it, if it means that. Um, but they're not generally taking the risk that a general contractor does. And so what's happening here is a uh, owner looks at a typical uh, uh, sworn statement from a GC and says, okay, here's what the plumber's gonna cost, here's what the electrical's gonna cost, here's the carpenters, et cetera, et cetera, and it all adds up. And then they add a big percentage for their work. Uh, and they add you know, some other money for you know, kind of keeping the overhead, for keeping the project going. So that profit that they're just adding in at the end of that drives the owners crazy because they're like, whoa, why should I be paying this huge amount of profit? Uh, and so what the construction manager does is it says, well, okay, I'm not gonna pay anybody else profit, I'm just gonna hire a guy and they're going to be the construction manager, and they're going to work directly for me, so they'll get paid. Uh, I'm not going to not pay them or anything like that, but they're just going to get paid like a regular person and not get paid this sort of big lump of profit. The obvious disadvantage of that situation is 
one of the reasons that the contractors do that is because sometimes everything works out just the way they thought and sometimes it doesn't. So if they're you know, putting a bid in for a million dollars for a project and they are able to do it for 900,000, well, awesome, they just made an extra 100 grand. Uh, but if it turns out it actually cost them 1.2 uh, million and their bid was for a million, uh, they just lost 200 grand. So the owners have a tendency to say, oh, that money, I don't wanna let that money go away. I'm gonna do the construction manager uh, and save that money, but it means they're now assuming the risk that the GCs were, assu were assuming. Now they're doing it in a way with a real knowledge base. The whole point of the construction manager is that they bring a lot of knowledge. They understand how to uh, run a project. They understand how to bring subs in. But now the contractor, the subcontractors are signing directly their contracts with the owner, not with a GC, because there is no GC. Uh, so this can be very advantageous for a bunch of reasons and a little dangerous for a bunch of reasons, like any of the different project delivery methods. The big reason that people love construction managers is imagine a typical design bid build. So it's typical general contractor, architect, and owner set of relationships. You design it, the project, you're designing for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months. You go through SD, DD, you're having all these conversations with the owner, you get to CDs, uh, you uh, produce a big set of uh, bid documents. Now, many months later, we're handing these drawings over to some contractors, they're bidding them all out, uh, we get some real numbers back, and that's really the first point that we've had a third party review of whether we're on track with our, with our budget. So if we turns out we're you know, double the cost, we're you know, over by a couple million bucks, well, it's kind of late, right? I mean, we're, you've, you've had all of this work done, now you have to go back through and redo a bunch of work, and it just takes even more time. So design, bid, build may be perfectly great for certain reasons, but it has a few flaws. And one of the flaws is I don't find out about the cost until deep into the project. So the big advantage of having a CM on board is they're on board early. Uh, they're there to review the schematic drawings and they're giving direct pricing right at that point. And as you're going into DD, they're looking at all the specific things there and they're giving pricing at that point. And then they're giving more pricing as you go through the CD sets. So they're giving early and useful pricing through the whole process which presumably means that by the time you get to the end, everybody's known the cost all the way through. And that, for the right kind of project, that can be hugely advantageous. So the answer here is D. All right, we're down to 15 over here. All right, hang on to your hats, 15. I'm, I'm, I have belief in you. All right, number five. The rights, responsibilities, and relationships for the owner, architect, and general contractor are called out in the so first of all, it's worth noting here that every one of these things is referring to the AIA documents, contracts that are uh, AIA um, written. Uh, the exam will only use the AIA documents. They're not going to show any other ones. There are other documents and some of them are pretty good. I actually think the AIA documents are not bad. I have complaints about it. Everybody has complaints about them. But uh, uh, I think in, in the grand scheme of things, they're, they're pretty solid and they seem to be reasonably fair. You can imagine, though, that if you're a contractor or if you're a developer, the idea that uh, the you know, Institute of Architects is writing your contracts, things, they might feel like things are a little tilted towards the architects. So not everybody loves them. I think they're pretty fair and understand the construction pretty well. But don't worry about any of the other contracts that are out there. You should know that they exist, but don't worry about any of those. You only really want to be reading the AIA documents uh, because those are the ones you're going to get uh, questioned on. So, Question here is, the rights, responsibilities, and relationships for the owner, architect, and the general contractor are called out. So where are they called out? Well, is it in the B-101, the owner-architect agreement? Well, in a certain way, the answer to that would be yes. Uh, the CM-101, I just made that one up, by the way. Um, there is no such CM-101. Um, uh, construction manager, well, that's a different thing. You wouldn't actually have a general contractor. It's a construction manager in that context. So it's definitely not B. So, so far, A seems sort of plausible because in a certain way, it's, it's, uh, all those things are referenced there. Uh, and then D, I have the A101, the owner-contractor agreement. Uh, and these are the main B101 and A101 are the big main ones. There's a whole bunch of other, there's the 104, the 107, et cetera, that um, 
are for specific scale projects and certain kinds of uh, um, payment schemes and things like that. Um, but the general ones are the B101 and the A101. And both of those are potentially correct answers. But the reason they're potentially correct is because both of them reference in the A201 general conditions. So the answer is C because what's really happening here is that the general conditions is the place where you go for all of the definitions of things, all the roles and responsibilities of all the different players, uh, all of that kind of stuff uh, that is, would be too much information to put directly into uh, the contract. It would make the contracts enormous, but by referencing in the general conditions, both of the contracts are now using the same definitions. So when it says general contractor, uh, you know, in some document, the architect has a definition of what that means because it's, uh, they've signed in their B101, part of that B101 is a reference to, we're including the A201 in this document. Uh, so when it says review shop drawings or something like that, drawings that are coming from the contractor, well, yeah, you have to do that because that's all part of the roles and responsibilities that have been laid out in uh, the general conditions. May not mention it in the contract, but it definitely is referenced in because all the rights, responsibilities, and relationships of all these, speci specifically these important players, plus a few other subs and, and surveyors and things like that, uh, uh, is, is delineated in that A201 general conditions. Uh, so C uh, is the answer. All right, down to 13. All right. We got a couple holding on here. Number six, last but not least. When does an architect with a typical contract perform a cost estimate? I get asked this question all the time. It's kind <laughs> of a fascinating one. Uh, and whenever I uh, do something like this, I always put in uh, a D here. Uh, an architect never performs a cost estimate because there's a whole school of thought that um, architects shouldn't uh, do cost estimates because that's just not their, uh, their, per their strength. Um, that they just don't bring a lot of useful information for that. And in a lot of other countries, that's actually quite true. Um, you have cost estimating as a whole division, a whole separate industry in the United Kingdom and in Germany and a bunch of other places. So uh, in the United States, where we're talking about here, um, the architect actually does perform cost estimates actually pretty regularly. So then it's not D, so the question becomes, all right, well then, what is it? Uh, a would be at the end of each phase of design, schematic design, design development, and uh, contract documents. That seems like a reasonable answer, but let's look at the other ones. Let's uh, go through. B says at the beginning of the project to set the scale, and then again after the contract document phase to start off construction. That one seems a little problematic. I'll come back to that in a second. C, at the beginning of a project, at the end of schematic design and at, uh, at the end of design development. So the question here really becomes which of these makes the most sense for the architect's use of time? And the kind of catcher here is why would the architect be doing uh, a cost estimate uh, at the end of the contract document phase? If you think about it, that's what bidding is. So you're not doing it, you're handing it out to a bunch of other people. It is important that you're doing it at the end of uh, the SD phase and at the end of the DD phase, just to make sure that you're on track. So those are not gonna be highly detailed, uh, especially at SD. As you get into DD, it's probably gonna get pretty detailed. You're gonna be pretty close to a real cost estimate. Um, but you need to be doing those in order to make sure everything's on track in terms of the cost of the project, but by the time you get to the end of CDs, it's sort of too late for you to do a cost estimate. Now you're handing it over to the bidders and they're gonna do the cost estimate for you. So in the end, A is not the correct answer uh, and C does make uh, a great deal of sense. So uh, if you think of it, uh, how would you start a project if you hadn't thought about what the cost and scale and budget was? So you're gonna be doing a very simple version of a cost estimate at the beginning of a project, 
you're going to do it at the end of schematic design uh, to make sure you're still on track, and you're going to do it at the end of design development uh, in order to make sure before you go into that whole contract document phase, okay, we've made a bunch of decisions that we leaped quite a bit from schematic design into our design development, but when we made that leap, we've got to make sure that we haven't accidentally let it creep out of control uh, or just miss the mark and maybe it's too little, almost never is too little, uh, almost always too much. Uh, but uh, by the time you get to that end of design development, it's very difficult to backtrack through. So you want to make sure and you're going to do all you can to make sure that the end of that design development is actually making sense, uh, both from a design standpoint, you're comparing it back to the program, you're comparing it to the code reviews you've done, you're comparing it to all of those different things. So we're still on track, it's still the right building, it's still going to fit in this urban context, and you're comparing it back to your initial uh, budget information and checking what you think the cost actually is. Does it still sit right with that initial budget? So uh, absolutely C would be the answer. And then at the end of CDs, we got the bidders to give us the, the bids at that point. So now it's in the ballpark of the contractors. So C would be the answer. Awesome. All right. Um, we do have a couple of windows there. We'll get to them in a minute. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Mike. Um, and uh, thank you for everyone who participated. I think we had a, a really awesome list of folks here who, um, who submitted their questions. Um, so thank all of you. Um, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, uh, where we're going to be using um, a programming and analysis mock exam, kind of like this, um, to cover all of the most complicated and difficult sort of topics in that division, um, I just posted a link in the chat box um, in the GoToWebinar control panel. So just go down to where it says chat, and the link is there. Or um, you can simply go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. That link is up now. Um, and just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feed back during the broadcast. Um, to learn a little bit more about, so here at Black Spectacles, as you probably know, we do exam prep for, you know, for the ARE. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to blackspectacles.com where you can uh, check out some of the free course videos. Um, and as I always like to say, if you want your boss to pay for your membership, be sure to visit blackspectacles.com slash firms. And who doesn't want their boss to yeah, pay for their that's membership? Always, that's yeah, the, that's definitely the way to go. Um, so yes, yeah, so you, can, you can go there to check that out. Um, we're proud to be uh, NCARB's first ever approved test prep provider. Um, uh, for five of the five that we submitted, we're, uh, we'll be uh, excited to announce uh, when that last division is hopefully approved. Um, for those of you who are hanging on uh, and are ready to start preparing for the ARE right now, we have a specific coupon code for you guys, and that coupon code is PJM111518YT. And that gets you a 15% discount for the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership. And for all of you um, who tuned in, make sure that you submit your answers to our next mock exam um, so you can be entered into our monthly drawing. I appreciate everyone who did. And then finally, tomorrow we'll send you an email follow-up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know what you think. Share any suggestions that you may have. Uh, I promise we read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.